Hello everybody, I am Zenith Rule, and welcome back to the Disney debate where Cat McBerry, Doug McBerry, and I discuss Disney products, Disney films, and everything in between, along with my cat Chiaki, who is here on my lap right now. Um, everyone say hello to Chiaki, because she is the cutest, most wonderful cat in the world. Hi, and Chiaki. She and, Hi, Chiaki. And she loves to... She loves to take over my show, <laughs> and now well, she's, that's her job. she's leaving because we're giving her attention. <laughs> she's like, I shall not be exploited. <laughs> <laughs> Although she is, when, whenever we're on stream, she loves being exploited. She becomes part of the stream constantly just because she wants to. <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyway, I am joined once again by my good friend, Cat McBerry. Hello. What's up? <laughs> and her husband, the Baldy McBaldy Pants himself, Doug McBerry. Hello, Fatty McFatty Pants. And uh, we are here to to continue the 101 Dalmatians Marathon. Uh, we have covered the two animated films, and for the most part, those were good films. And last time we covered the first live action film, which um, for for 50% of it, I would say is a pretty good remake. Aside from the stuff near the end where they tried to rip off Home Alone and they injected a lot of things that really didn't need to be in there. Um, but today we have something genuinely, genuinely bad. We have something that... <laughs> it should be avoided at all costs. Today we're talking <laughs> today we're talking about 102 Dalmatians and this is a sequel to the remake of an animated film. Um and it this does not have any ambition. This does not have any um quality control. This is a movie that is so bad it's uh, I, I want to say it's so bad it's amazing, but it doesn't quite get to that territory. Like, there are some parts that are really, really um, enjoyably bad, and there are a lot of parts that are just... Uh, th there are a lot of parts that are just plain bad. There are a lot of parts that just do not work. This is a film that is unfortunately not, you know, so bad it's amazing, um, like, it, it's not like The Room where you can watch it and enjoy it for just how bad it is. It's not like, um, you know, it's not like Birdemic. It's not like any of these things that you can watch or, or, or a game that you can play and just enjoy it because of all the problems. Here, this was a slog to get through for most of it. And while a lot of the charm is remains in certain places there's just so much we can talk about um that just did not work did not make sense and just is a waste of your time well i don't know if i'd say it, be as harsh on it as you are but we'll get to that part i mean i watched this when i first came out so i might have a bit of a nostalgia factor like that's making me not as like harsh on it but yeah, I will admit that this film compared to like the last three we watched, like, like definitely nowhere near as good. <laughs> it's like it clearly wants to be um, a, a sequel to the first film, but my main issue with it is that it does not feel like a sequel to the first film. So, with that being said, Cat, why don't you give us a brief summary? of what is going on in this mess of a film. All right, so 102 Dalmatians takes place about three years after the first movie, by which point Cruella de Vil has been put through this intensive rehabilitation program. It's similar to Dr. Pavlov's experiment, except sort of reversed, where they try to get, you know, the, the prey and the predators to get along through whatever means they they aren't very specific about it but it's in it's hinted at that it's pretty intense um she's deemed to be uh, rehabilitated by the court she's released onto probation and they may they say that oh she she will get to get her freedom so long as she doesn't go back to dog napping 
Well, it just so happens that her probation officer, a woman named Chloe, happens to be the owner of one of the former 15 puppies owned by uh, Anita and Roger, who's now grown up, has a mate, and recently she just gave birth to three little puppies. So, what a coinkydink. Um... Well, it seems that Corella, for the most part, is cured, and part of her probation is she has to do community service. So she actually buys out this shelter uh, called Second Chance, which is being run by these two guys. And for the while, it seems things are doing good. You know, she prevents it from being shut down. The dogs are saved. She's putting a lot of money into it, doing good things. Of course, Chloe has her suspicions, obviously, due to her history with uh, Dipstick and his siblings. But then eventually... Uh, eventually the whole experiment goes out the window because it turns, because it turns out that if you ring a bell really loud, it undoes all the brainwashing Cruella, Cruella has, uh, endured. And now she's back to normal, she's now full-blown evil, and she has plans to once again kidnap a hundred, this time 102 Dalmatians to make her new coat. And that is probably as simplified a plot as I can pretty much do, because this... As you said, this story kind of goes all over the place, and the plot is a bit, uh, it go, it, I wouldn't say go off the rails, but it gets really unfocused at times. <laughs> I, I think the, I think the biggest problem with this film is that there's no real central, um, conflict, no real central idea on what they wanted to do with it, because, yes, you have the rehabilitation of Cruella de Vil because you need... You need to have a way to have your villain get out of jail. So instead of breaking out of jail, they decided, okay, we're going to have her rehabilitated. What would happen if Cruella de Vil was not, uh, was not the villain anymore? Well, you don't have a film then, because like they have to go through all these hoops, all these lengths to, to bring Cruella back to where she was in the original film, and they really didn't need to do that. And I think the biggest, um, the, the the first issue that we can bring up here is the whole method of rehabilitation. Um, they they talked about how they were giving her like various different, uh, th like shock treatment therapy and and all these behavioral therapies and like Pavlov Pavlov's a scientist who's working on her, so it's kind of like. Uh, reverse of like the real Pavlov, um, but somehow it's un it's undone by her hearing Big Ben. Now Big Ben <laughs> rings every single day, like it's the biggest thing in London, and she is she is out of um, herself for quite a while. They show her in various different magazines, everywhere she is everywhere and then all of a sudden one day like it, it must be months later on it, it has to be months later on mm -hmm. she hears big ben and all of a sudden like all of the test subjects once they hear big ben um are back to their original selves and i'm like how how did they not hear big ben at any point before this i i mean it's possible that, you know, the, the whole clinic might be outside of London, hence why they never heard it before. Cause, because the only, to the only reason they heard Big Ben to begin with is because it was being featured on the television. But, I mean, that doesn't excuse the whole thing with Cruella, though, because she's been in London. The, the shelter is located in London, like, presumably. And, I mean, either way, it is pretty much assume that she does travel to and from especially because her probation officer is based right outside the clock and big ben i believe chimes every hour on the hour so unless she you know unless she's visiting the office like in between for like 15 minutes at a time and just is out of there be before like the clock rings it's just it's it's so unbelievable that she never heard it before that one point in the film it, it makes no goddamn sense at all it is extremely contrived. It is it is specifically put in there um, to make her get to a certain point. And while I, f I found the transformation sequence to be probably the best part of the film, 
simply because it's so ridiculous and over the top, and then she sees the entire world covered in spots. Like, <laughs> that that was enjoyable, but it, it doesn't... You know, you could have used any other reasoning, um, like... Some like maybe it was water that brought her back, uh, or or the smell of something, or like being around dogs, maybe, or like there are ways that you could get around this without having it be something that she would have been around twenty four seven. Um, Doug, would you agree with this? Oh yeah, no, she definitely she'd been in the heart of London the whole time since uh, her rehabilitation. There is no excuse that she would not have encountered Big Ben's uh, ring at any time. Um, like this to me was was the first like down check of the film because like I I think the premise of Cruella Deville being cured is intriguing. It's interesting to play with a character that is evil turned good. But the film didn't clearly want her to stay this way, and it just it felt like a wasted opportunity in in my opinion. Like uh some people might disagree with this fact. Some people might think that Corella should always be evil. Um but if they were going to go this route, they should have brought in another villain um, or, you know, do something different with it. Well, technically, they had another villain. They introduced the new character, La Pelt. He's, uh, he's a, uh, I'm trying to think of the term here. He He's like a fur guy. You know, he, he gets in animals, he skins them, and he has their furs made into luxurious outfits. And then he puts on this whole fashion show with, you know, showcasing those said outfits. Um, I've... I don't the the thing is like I wondered how this film would have worked out had they had it that Cruella was rehabilitated, she stayed good, but then Lapelt, who happened to be a fan of hers, realized that realized that she had given up on her whole fashion industry ideal of like promoting furs and stuff and is now trying to get her back into it by constantly exposing her to furs, which could have, you know, undone some of her uh some of her uh conditioning techniques because i mean that would make sense you know like she was pretty much forced to be evil again against her wit against her will i mean i that's just the one scenario i can think of that might have worked out better in this film because like because the fact that she just she just changes on a whim from this really from this really like contrived like reason and it, and she doesn't just you know change her mindset she like physically turns evil like she grows shoulder pads her hair becomes wild her fingernails become long and it's like wow this is we're really getting into cartoon char- like territory here like this, this isn't even like why even go live action now <laughs> like I, I do think your suggestion would have worked, but also there's a second scenario that I could also see where if they take uh, LaPelt and they make him the central villain um, and keep Cruella as as a heroic figure, make her the main character and having to thwart another person. Like, I don't know. I just find it interesting to see a villain turn good and maybe she turned evil at the end of the film i don't know but like i think exploring that dynamic for longer than they did in this film would have worked for me um would have worked for me too yeah (laughs) yeah i i really think like they if, if they were gonna have her you know revert back at least like have it happen you know either halfway into the film or you know, like in the cli- toward the climax of the film, don't make that the uh, like. How how far were we even into the film? We weren't even like twenty minutes in before she reverts. <laughs> yeah, like she reverts pretty early on, and not only that, but like she um, never really gives off a vibe that she's going to stay this way. Uh, but also. 20 minutes into that into the film by the point where she's had this transformation um we're we're not supposed to consider her the main character of the film i don't even know who the main character of the film even is because we don't learn any of the other characters names 
for over 20 minutes. We know who Cruella is. We know her who her assistant is from the previous movie. So we can assume that. But none of the other characters have been around before besides the Dalmatians. And yet they keep f- switching focus between um, four different characters. Most of which we don't know and don't care about. Doug, I, I know you wanted to talk about this. Mm-hmm. So you have the floor. Yes. So on the DVD cover and even on like the old VHS cover, uh, it says there's a tagline that says, meet two unlikely heroes with a bone to pick. First off, who are these two heroes we're talking about? And second of off, you know, I have a bone to pick. I have 102 bones to pick with this movie because it's like, <laughs> Who are these people? Who's supposed to be a main character aside from Cruella? And then there's also, you know, who is this uh, probation officer that suddenly has one of the uh, 15 Dalmatians? I want to get into that a little more later on. Uh, It's like, it's explain movie, explain We are just thrust into the scenario where we obviously know who Cruella is. I mean, obviously, anyone who's grown up with 101 Dalmatians knows who Cruella de Vil is. But then we have this probation officer, which we don't know anything about, we're never told anything about, and I don't even remember her name. Uh, Obviously, like, it's, it's stated in the film, but it's stated very late into it, and like, but, but... More importantly, who is this person um, in relation to any of the other films? If they're going to have a new character, fine, but you have to introduce your characters. Um, and then we have the these British guys who run this dog shelter, and we don't learn anything about these two people until near the end of the film. Uh, The first one is always um, on the run from his probation officer because he doesn't have the money, Um, but we don't really learn anything about him. And the other one, the only thing we ever really learn about him is that he had a dog napping charge, and then um, we learn the specifics. The we learn the specifics of that later on in the film, but that's literally all we really learn about these people. These aren't characters, and if you're going to showcase these characters, they have to have a reason to be here. The previous cast had a reason because their dogs were being kidnapped, but but like there's no connection between these new people and Cruella de Vil, and she says she's going to get her revenge for what? Yeah, I don't understand that either, because... I mean, if she's going to get revenge, why not get revenge on, you know, the either the original dogs or the dog's owners? But no, she's just going to take it out on the next set of Dalmatians she sees. Okay, well, that's not really vengeance. That's just pro- projecting anger. <laughs> like, it, it makes no sense. I mean, God. And, and like, the other characters, like, really, they're just... They're kind of more plot devices than characters because we need... The probation officer Chloe there because she happens to own one of the original dogs that Cruella, I guess, swore vengeance against. Where, again, and somehow recognizes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I guess we should just talk about this. The, the it makes no goddamn sense why why Dipstick is in this movie because they don't explain they don't explain um, why he's owned by a completely different person and not Anita and Roger. Uh, she doesn't explain how she knows them, is related, or if she's related to them, or how she came about owning Dipstick, or if she like had her own dog, and then like it was a sort of a similar scenario, like with uh, Pongo and and Purdy. I mean, they don't explain any of that. It's just, oh, she happens to own him, and he happens to remember uh, Cruella and what she almost did to him as a puppy, and she somehow remembers him, even though she never really interacted with him directly as a puppy. Like, none of this makes sense, and it's like a very flimsy way of just connecting the old movie to the second one. And then the two guys that run the shelter, they're pretty much there to be patsies, because... You know, because, of course, Corella 
it becomes her sort of salvation at first, but then when she becomes evil, she's like, okay, well, if I'm going to get away with my scheme, I better have someone take the fall for this. Oh, I know, these two guys, because obviously they have the most to gain from, from my downfall. So, yeah, pretty much any other new character in this is a plot convenience or a plot device. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I just... It does feel like they... If... If you wanted to connect it to the previous film and you couldn't get the original actors, here's what you do. You recast. It doesn't always work, but you kind of have to, you know, have a reason for these things to happen. As it stands, we have all these random characters. We have all these random people um, that aren't connected to Cruella yet are thrust into Cruella's uh, domain for no reason. And they're, like, and Cruella, like, takes over this dog shelter, and she says, oh, I'm going to rescue the dogs until she's changed. And then she wants to recreate her her coat, and she ha suddenly has this new henchman. Um, well, partner, I guess you would say, this, this pelt guy. But even still... All of these connections were never established before in any of the previous continuities. And you could probably retcon some of it to say like, oh, well, she knew these people, but didn't bring it up in the, the other films because there was no need for her to bring it up. But like this dog shelter has no reason to be the focus of the film, even if I, I guess you would call it the focus. But the what is it? Oddball and the bird who thinks he's a dog, they're on the cover of the DVD. Like, I guess these are supposed to be the main characters, but they're not the focus. They're not. Like, they're they're obviously marketing, like, mascots, that's for sure, because I remember seeing them everywhere, both in the commercials, the trailers, on merchandise. Like, they were everywhere, but... Honestly, like, Oddball's whole story, like, and Wad Wadsworth whole thing, like, their little arcs, yeah, they're, like, plot D, plot E of the film. Like, they have little to no bear bearing on anything. I don't understand why they're in the film. Why, why, is, why does the bird think he's a dog? Yeah, they never explain that, nor do they explain why he... Why he can speak and understand perfect English. <laughs> or can understand dogs, for that matter. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I, I get why he was added, because my complaint from the first film was that they didn't have the dogs talk, which meant that a lot of the film was basically silent, as, you know, you had to kind of guess what the dogs were thinking or saying to each other. In this case, you have, like, an actual translator for what the dogs are saying, but... Again, it, it's, it still doesn't quite work to me, cause, just because Wadsworth is so freaking annoying. Plus, he they try to make it so that he has his own thing going on where he has to discover how to fly and act like a bird, but that doesn't really go anywhere except for, like, this one scene toward the climax. <laughs> That's about it. Ugh. Yeah, and even on the, uh, the subject of him, uh, like talking uh to the dogs or and, and to the people it's like he doesn't even really translate much he just kind of says you know generic phrases and you know nothing of real importance for the most part <laughs> i still don't understand how you have wings your entire life but never know how to use them even if he thinks he's a dog like you have wings, he's clearly shown flapping his wings in a couple instances, and he doesn't want to fly, because he says he's a dog. It, 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 your, your joke does not work, your arc does not work, because I've had legs my entire life, I've had ears my entire life, I have a, a mouth my entire life, I know how to use them, and it's not something of, oh, I think I'm something else, no, like... Even if I believed that I was something else, I would still be able to use my mouth because that's just an instinct. I guess it's just to make the, the whole group of animals nice and quirky because they each get their nice little quirk, which comes in handy at the opportune moment. So, yeah. 
And, like, some of these things, I'm like, I, I they're supposed to be dogs that have been rejected by owners because of certain traits. Um, I get some of them, like, drooler because he drools a lot. But, I mean, there's got to there's be an owner out there that would pick up a dog like that. But, like, there's another one, Digger, who's just always digging. I'm like, every single dog digs. And they're they're trying to make it out to be like oh no he was he was ev evacuated uh, he was banned from all these parks and I'm like dude have you seen dogs before every single dog digs in a yard <laughs> I just love they try to turn these dogs into like the new seven dwarfs you know they all have names based on their like their quirks <laughs> it's like the only way you even remember them <laughs> yeah well they don't even have character I mean they're they're obviously animals but they don't have a personality like some of the dogs in uh, previous films. So they might as well be interchangeable. So the plot is kind of all over the place with just the things randomly happening. Um, it can't decide whether to make it make up its mind who the main character is. So we have a jumble of plot and characters that do not interconnect with like five subplots. There's, there's subsequently too much going on with not enough going on at the exact same time which is you know we've seen this before but in this case it really emphasizes that with all the subplots for every single character that lasts for like five seconds at the end of the film um but you know i guess i guess like the the whole build-up is for this major fight between the villains and the heroes, I, I don't know which is which at this point, but uh, there's a fight between Pelt and Cruel's assistant. And, and well, before we even get into that, Cruel's assistant is is given a lot of shit this film, like really unnecessarily amount of shit. Yeah, I was like, when I look back at this, I'm like, wow, like. I remember Alonzo in the first film was, like, talked down and shouted at a lot, but that was pretty much what Cruella did to, like, everyone she came across, so I didn't think it was anything special. In this movie, they, like, dial it up to 11. She's, like, not his servant, like, more like his manslave, because she has him do all of this, like, horrible, illegal shit, which he somehow is able to pull off. And he just, he does not question her. He does not have a moment of doubt. He just does it. Like, I, 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 like, I know he ultimately ends up having, like, this arc where he finally stands up for himself and does the right thing. But, like, it takes him forever to do it. And he never really has a profound moment where he realizes, hey, I'm doing bad, evil shit. I should probably stop this. No, he, his, his turnaround moment is when Lapel insults him again for, like, the final time. And he's like, all right, that's it. I'm kicking your ass. And then suddenly we're supposed to root for him now. It's like, it's like I feel bad for him because he does suffer a lot of, like, physical abuse. And he gets hurt a lot. But... I kind of don't feel bad because, again, he, he somehow single-handedly by himself managed to steal uh, ni 99 of the 102 puppies and transport them all to France, like, by himself on Cruella's whim. It's like, okay, how many more dogs are you going to go through before you realize, hey, I'm doing some fucked up shit. I should probably stop this. I'm basically sending all these poor little puppies to their deaths. Yeah, it's it's one of those things where I question what they were trying to do with this character. Um, if you're going to make him, uh, re if you're going to try to redeem the character, then don't put him through all that shit because they had him run it like his hands were run over by a car. He was bitten by several dogs. Like they're they're giving him all of this, and you're supposed to be feel bad for him, but there's no point in the film where he gradually just says, oh, I'm done with this, I've had enough of this, um, he just changes like that, like that. If you're going to give him a redemption arc, what you do is you l allow him to see what he's doing and second-guess it, and now, like, he's seen what Corolla was like before, 
maybe have him start trying to stand up to Cruella or something um, because it read it, it comes across as mean spirited, and not only that, it just feels it feels very forced. Like a lot of the stuff in this movie, it feels very forced. Yeah, it, it definitely does. And I, I should also mention too, like it kind of ties into an issue I have with the film as a whole in the fact that it has contradicting messages because. A big theme of this is about, of the film, is about second chances. You know, Cruella got a second chance to become good again. Uh, these dogs that were thrown away by their owners or have a second chance at living a more, ha- a happier, more productive life. And, oh, you know, all this stuff. But then they, imme- they, then they immediately destroy their message by having Cruella turn evil again and, you know, not regret it for a second. And then they have, uh, you know, the character of Alonzo given a second chance even though he didn't really deserve it and then they have uh and then they have uh what was it they ha- they have like the, all the ca- the two characters one who they have the probation officer who was rightful to be suspicious and then starts to trust the villain only to get betrayed and then the one and then the one shelter guy who trusts easily suddenly turns around and is like oh now i don't trust anybody it's like w- what's going on what are you trying to say here i i, I don't get it like it's it's just so confusing (laughs) yeah like there's just a lot of really weird messages and the thing is the catalyst for all of this the dr pavlov and his name is actually dr pavlov which ha 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 but the the dr pavlov that worked and to cure her he knows he knows that his thing is a failure when all his animal subjects hear the clock. But he does nothing, and he gets no repercussions in the film. Nope. In fact, I don't even think he shows up again after uh, that point. Nope. Nope. It's like, oh, Jesus, my experiment f- my experiment fucked up and in a really significantly bad manner. I'm going to keep this on the down low as much as possible. Yeah, that let's see how well that works out for you. <laughs> because nobody would find out that this was a failure when Cruella eventually started kidnapping puppies again. I mean, I understand that they have this whole court order where if she ever starts kidnapping puppies, um her entire fortune will be given to the dogs, which is kind of a weird settlement. I don't think the government would ever do that, but okay, if if this is what you want in the universe, Okay, um, one, why would Cruella still go through with it in such a public manner? Because she knew her fortune would just go away. Um, and two, like, you, you, when that gets out, when Cruella eventually starts, you know, going back on her bullshit, and she will, it's gonna come back to you, but we never see that in the film. Like, what if he was the villain? What if we were against the scientist or... Like, there's just so many questions, um, and instead it, it builds up to a climax where they fight against Pelt. Um, it's Pelt versus Alonzo, which is the weakest villain fight in history. And then Cruella versus um, all the misfit dogs, where she gets sent to a bakery, which is apparently next door from to the villain's hideout, um, this random bakery, um, and she gets baked into a cake. Allow me to repeat this. Cruella de Vil, one of the greatest Disney villains, gets baked into a cake. And she lives. And so, she lives. Yes, because again, we're operating on cartoon logic in this movie. Oh, God. Oh, God. I really freaking hate this scene. Like, I was already, like... I already did not like the climax in the first 101 Dalmatians because, again, as I said, because, you know, they basically strip away all the dignity and refinement of Cruella and make her into another pratfall. Because, like, where in that one she was, you know, covered in shit and mud, in this one she got baked into a cake. And it's like, why? Is this a metaphor for something? Did... 
is this supposed to like represent like her character like is there any re like sort of meaning to this or it's just some random thing somebody thought up and is like oh how can we top ourselves from you know throwing her into the mud and everything i know let's somehow bake her into a cake it'll be funny i don't uh. get it i just don't get it and it's such a big, <laughs> long, elaborate scene, too. Like, the scene goes like on she forever. She could have gotten out of it. She could have gotten out of it at any time, too. But her hubris wouldn't allow her to stop. It, you know, when I was a kid, this was the one scene that I remember loving. Because this was the only thing I remember about the film. And I remember enjoying this as a kid. But it's just so pandering it's so like overly long you're right at any point she could have probably gotten out of it but she kn no she has to keep rushing to get these puppies dude cut your losses you're covered with batter and then like she gets like gone and she gets thrown into the furnace and then she starts walking down as she gets out of the uh, out of the pan and the dog starts sprinkling like sprinkles on her here's a hint stop walking like, you're supposed to be one of Disney's smartest villains. Like, Cruella oh. is cunning. She's conniving. She's she's manipulative. She likes plotting things. This Cruella is a doofus. Cat, well, how many times during the movie did I point out flaws in her plan? Yeah, but the, here's the thing, though. This is... I. I Let's talk about her plan, like the first one that she did. Uh, after she turns evil again, she, of course, wants to go back to making her coat. However, she knows this time that there's no way she can get caught doing this. And <clears throat> granted, her, the, the plan she comes up with has flaws, but in a way, part of it is actually kind of brilliant. She, she bas basically how the plan goes, for the most part, it the first stage anyway, is that she sets up the two guys from the shelter to take the fall for all the missing puppies. Because she has Alonzo go and steal all the puppies, which, again, he somehow does without getting caught or seen. And she plants some of those puppies at the shelter or has it arranged that they go and pick up the puppies. Then she calls the police. The police, having known that these puppies are missing, sees that they have them, sees all this evidence that she planted around the place incriminating them, and actually gets them arrested. Like, and because, and, the, and furthermore, they actually have motive to do this because again going back to the whole court order saying that if she's caught kidnapping dogs then her all of her money goes to the local shelter which means they have a reason to set to try and set her up so in a way that plan is actually kind of brilliant you know you have the perfect patsies and she uses that to her advantage like brilliantly because they're all thrown in jail she gets the dogs back she's able to go ahead with her plan with no suspicion thrown on her whatsoever but yeah, then of course, as I'm sure you will point out, Doug, there are other things that come up that slowly start to put holes in her plan until we lead to the big climax, which completely undoes everything and mm -hmm. makes Cruella come off even worse than she did in the original. Am I mind pointing yeah. out those flaws, Doug? P sure. Please point out and those fact, flaws. And in fact, actually, while we were talking, uh, I actually just realized another thing, and I... There's really no reason for this thing to be there except for the one reveal. And that in the very beginning, Alonzo gives Cruella this, like, hairless dog. Mm. So, oh, yeah, fluffy. Yeah, th this thing does practically nothing throughout the whole film until they have this dinner. Um, you know, and I guess Cruella is supposed to be like sealing her alibi while, uh, you know, LaPelle and Alonzo go around to uh, steal the puppies. Uh, and uh, so earlier in the film, when, when she first gets uh, fluffy and she's come back to DeVille Manor, um, she goes up to her room and she throws down all of the furs and the, um, the, the picture uh, of the, uh, the, for their, uh, Dalmatian coat that Anita had drawn up in the first movie and they have it go into like this really stereotypical dungeon style basement 
<laughs> I, I can't even say that with a straight face. Um, so, yeah. So, later on, during that dinner, Fluffy somehow gets an, uh, the new probation officer's attention to, uh, you know, go and somehow get into the dungeon and finds, like, all that stuff. And, uh, you know... In the process, Cruella catches the probation officer, you know, seeing the evidence, and decides to lock her in the dungeon. And this is, like I said, at the same time as uh, the the cronies are going off and uh, stealing the Dalmatian puppies. So it's like, you would think, uh, two and two together, when the Dalmatians turn up missing, and everybody at the dinner has, you know, last seen this uh, probation officer at the dinner, dinner you would think obviously scotland yard's gonna come knocking at cruella's door so it's like yeah you done fucked up <laughs> and then of course there's uh you know they take the uh, the puppies on the orient express to paris and uh the probation officer and the uh the guy from the second chance shelter show up and it's like, they know Cruella's on there. They know that they have the uh, the puppies. They could just contact the station manager and have the train stopped or, you know, stop at the next station and immediately, like, investigate. Nobody gets it on or off the train. But no, they never do that. <sighs> uh, and, and there is no murder on this Orient Express, unfortunately. There's an... There's a planned murder. That's something. <laughs> there, there's attempted murder. <laughs> Here's another thing. How does she still have the drawing that Anita made in this film? Like, why would she have it in her place? Because yeah, wouldn't they take it into evidence? Yeah. <laughs> if if not that, like, she was never given this drawing. Anita always held on to it. How? What does she have copies of it? I. It like there's so many continuity like errors in this film there's so many plot holes and like <sighs> Cruella is a horrible villain in this her plans make no sense she's not menacing if they're trying to make her like out to be oh she's crazy and like she's seeing you know seeing spots everywhere that only worked for one scene after that she never acts crazy she tries to act cunning and conniving, but it backfires, and she doesn't come across as any of those things. And then Pelt is okay. Like, I think he's funny, but he never was menacing, especially when he was wearing... A, a, he was wearing this outfit where he was wearing, like, a tiger as, like, underwear with the tiger head on his crotch area. It was ridiculous... But it wasn't intimidating. And while he's supposed to be this big, burly, like, man or whatever, like, he never came across to me as intimidating. If he's supposed to be, like, a sidekick, I could understand that. But no, this is supposed to be someone who's meant to be, like, the muscle. Like, he skins animals. Like, that's his thing. Everyone's supposed to be afraid of him. But I never really got that. Yeah, I think they did play him a little more comical, you know, so he wouldn't completely scare the children. Because, I mean, you already have Cruella de Vil, who's scary in and of herself. But in this case, yeah, like, they're like, we want to show him be menacing, but not quite as menacing. Like, I don't think they wanted to go like uh, Mr. Skinner in the first one, you know, kind of have this guy be more goofy. But, yeah, like, see, seeing that, 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 uh, (laughs) that, that. Was it? I think it was a cheetah, actually, like a cheetah crotch, like mm. belt or something. I'm like, really, dude, really? Th- this is your idea of fashion. <laughs> yeah, and it's like, and why would you do it in a place that has like, it's a public area. I I think it's like almost outside, and there are protesters that threw like well, tomato juice or something. Well, no, I think it's one of those closed events because they meant. Because originally Cruella was going to go protest it because she did hear about it through, like, this, this like, system. Because, I mean, mm. again, because I know there are fur shows, but they've, like, of course, are now drastically limited due to all the, you know, public outrage against them. So I assume it's more one of more of those more uh, underground things 
that you know if you're if you're in the industry you know where it is and what's going on so <laughs> yeah i i can understand that but it's just the whole fashion show was weird um and i didn't even know he was supposed to be the villain until like until after cruella went to visit him in there like they didn't focus the shots on him at all until he got angry and that's another thing this film is horribly shot it is completely average run of the mill there's no there's nothing to this editing this directing or this filmography that stands out in any way to make this feel like it's supposed to be a movie yeah not to mention the cgi is horrendous which oh god which is which is you know ironic considering how much they had to use in order to make the character of oddball work because the whole thi- the whole oddball's whole shtick is that she's a spotless dalmatian even though she's at the age where she should now have spots well from what i read they tried like several different methods including like painting over the spots spraying it using like a fake sk- fur skin um even getting a different breed of dog and they just couldn't hide the spots. So the only logical choice they had left was to CGI all of the spots out in every single frame of film. It took like over 55 people to do it. Like for every single frame the dog was in. It's like, well, it's like, well, what we, we see now where the budget went to. <laughs> Aside from Corella's wardrobe. And, and it doesn't even make sense why they do that. Because like... <laughs> What was it? I thought, like, they make it seem like... Cause they're trying to make Oddball to be the big hero there. It's like, oh yeah, she's an odd character. She doesn't fit in with her created or anything. Um, but she ends up uh, rescuing all the puppies. And she ends up being the hero and taking down Corella and everything. And then she happens to be rewarded at the end with spots. It's like, well, that kind of destroyed your whole message. I mean, weren't you going for the whole message that, oh, it doesn't matter if you're different or anything, you can still do great things? It's like, nope, do great things, and then you will be miraculously rewarded with what you want. Yeah, that works in real life. <laughs> the The actual message of the film is, if you bake your villain into a cake, everything is going to be A-OK. Just don't question it, it works. For the record, and for the record, uh, spotless Dalmatians, at least at that age, do not exist. Like they are spotless when they are born, but then they gain spots of like less than a few weeks after that. So yeah, <laughs> for anyone wondering. So yeah, um, like I know we've kind of been all over the place with this film, but that that's pretty much the film it's in its entirety. There's not enough to talk about with the plot. Because the plot is so damn cliche. The characters are non-existent. Um, There doesn't seem to be any effort put into this film. It's very much lowest common denominator. And while some things do stand out, like, again, the scene where she transforms and she starts seeing spots. That was an interesting scene. The beginning of the film where, where they were showing Cruella rehabilitated, that was interesting but i quickly lost interest with this film i kept looking at my watch and while i was laughing gleefully at her being baked into a cake it doesn't fit with what they were trying to do with the film it's all over the place it's scatterbrained it does not make sense it completely contradicts both itself and the previous films um so even if you're not a fan of the original films it's not a good movie, but if you're a fan of the original films, even the original live-action film, it does not make sense with. And that's like the biggest cardinal sin. It has no value whatsoever. It's worth maybe a laugh, um, but I consider it a waste of my time and a waste of your time. Kat, um, what are your final thoughts on this film? Yeah, I... I pretty much agree this is a bad film. Like, I can't bring myself to fully hate it. Like, at least I don't hate it as much as other films we've watched that I've hated significantly more. Um, I mean, it's pretty low, I would say, on the list. Because, like, is that, I, like, the only time the movie really pissed me off was, again, the scene with the cake. But, 
you know, that was kind of the same thing in the first film. Again, the climax with Coella being, you know, shat upon. That was always, like, the low point for me. Other than that, though, like, everything is just silly. It's like they, like, they just threw physics and the... And, you know, the whole let's go for a realistic setting type thing and swap it for this whole cartoony setting with no continuity and stuff that just doesn't make sense. Yeah, I, I like I said, it's it's a bad film, but I wouldn't call it like egregious or offending or anything. Just really nonsensical and pointless to have. Although I will say, I'll give this movie credit for one thing that it did better than the first 101 Dalmatians. We have a legitimate romance in this. Because while the characters of Chloe and Kevin are indeed bland and not that all rememberable, at least they actually had a decently set up relationship in this. You see them meet. You see them. You see one asking the other out on a date. You see that they have stuff in common. You actually see their date. And that's actually one of my favorite parts of the film. Because while they're going on their date, the dogs are watching uh, Lady and the Tramp on TV. And they're doing the whole spaghetti (laughs) scene. And meanwhile, those two happen to just be at a restaurant named Tony's and are also eating spaghetti in the same manner. It's like, wow, Disney, way to bash us over the head with your self-referential humor. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> oh, that ego needs stroking. <laughs> <laughs> but that said, at least, you know, they didn't, you know, meet, get married, and have sex all on the same day. You know, they actually, you know, it progressed like a, like a normal relationship should. So I will give it points for that. <laughs> all right, Mr. Doug, um, what are your final thoughts on this film? Well... I don't know if I can say anything that hasn't already been said, but I'm going to damn well give it a shot. <laughs> yeah, th- this movie just lacks so much focus. And honestly, it's like it-, it gets to the point where you can't even pay attention to it. And you're starting to think up a better movie in your own mind. Because let me tell you, I was actually the whole time thinking about this movie po- – I- revealing a big gaping contradiction to the uh, the first uh, movie, the remake. Uh, so basically, in the original animated movie, all of the, um, the 84 uh, Dalmatian puppies that they meet later are all bought and paid for. But when... Um, what you call it? When they do that in the uh, remake, they're all stolen. So... First off, why do Anita and Roger get to keep all of the puppies at the end if they're stolen? And then, to make matters worse, when we get to the rehab officer, uh, probation officer, uh, and she has dipstick, why then does she have one of Anita and Roger's original 15 puppies instead of one of the stolen dogs? See, that would make more sense if she was like one of the owners of the stolen dogs. That would give her reason to actually be in the film. But no, we have to have the name recognition in this. So it's like, that, that is basically what was going through my mind the whole time I'm watching this film. So that's about the broadest generalization I can make in final thoughts to this film. <laughs> it just raises too many questions. It, it raises all of the questions. And honestly, <laughs> like, I was actually looking forward to this film... Because when we brought it up, like, I'm like, oh, yeah, the one where Cruella gets baked into a cake, because that's all I remembered. I'm like, I was looking forward to this. This ruined my day. (laughs) Uh, This this has not been a fun experience, and I really hope the TV show is better, because um, I, I don't want this marathon to end on such a sour note. Um, But really, like... We've had three good films and one film that just... uh, You had potential. You had a good idea. Uh, This film feels like... It doesn't even feel like a a Dalmatian film. It feels like that 
Um, they wanted to make a sequel and said, all right, let's take one of the scripts from the shelf. Uh, you know, because a lot of a lot of film studios have scripts just lying around that they can use for something else. And they said, OK, this has dogs in it. Um, let's change a few things around and put Cruella de Vil in there. And then we could actually turn it into 102 Dalmatians. It doesn't feel it, it doesn't feel like it's a Dalmatians film. It doesn't feel like it was planned to be a sequel, even though, um, like, by all means, they, they, they were, it was a popular franchise, they were going to make a sequel, but it's just so all over the place that I just don't get why, um, this was made. Um, but anyway... <laughs> this was made because we had Glenn Close under contract, and God damn it, we're gonna use her. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, Glenn Close did amazing in the first film, here just some sometimes you just can't make shit into gold no matter how good your actor is um but with that said i am zenith rule i'm cat macberry i'm doug macberry and next time we are going to take a look at um at least five episodes of the dalmatians tv series and hopefully end this marathon on a good note because dear god um whatever you do just don't look up this film she she gets baked into a cake <laughs> she gets baked into a cake I've, I've got nothing else um anyway have a good one guys ttfn ta-ta for now she gets baked into a cake Hey, this is Magami33. Thank you for watching Zenith Will Review. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe for more awesome videos. If you like what you see, check out the Patreon page at patreon.com slash Zenith Will Review. And uh, in general, this is a movie that is... Ah, oh, God damn it. I forgot to turn off my phone. D damn it, Zen. Damn it, Zen. <laughs> Supposed to be professional here. <laughs> this is not my job. <laughs> Yes, it is. Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs>